I'm Jessica Berry with Dermatology Times, and today I'm speaking with Dr. Mark Lebwall. Um, we are discussing biologic use in the era of COVID-19. Um, so thank you so much for speaking with me today, Dr. Lebwall. My pleasure. So first I wanted to address the title of the article that was published um, in the Journal of the American Academy of Dermatology um, called Should Biologics for Psoriasis Be Interrupted in the Era of COVID-19? Um, I wanted to ask how this article kind of addresses that question um, and seeks to answer it, um, as well as some of the data that's presented within the article. You know, on, when the epidemic became apparent uh, we started getting hundreds of emails from patients, uh, dermatologists, um, asking, you know, what do I do with my patient on the biologic? Are they going to, you know, is this going to make them die from COVID-19? And, uh, you know, um, it's so unusual because we thought of many of the current biologics especially uh, as being very safe. We never considered those patients immunosuppressed. We never considered them more prone to uh, to bad viral infections. So um, what we did was we went back and looked at the trials from pivotal the data from pivotal trials to see what was the rate of viral and upper respiratory infections. Uh, and that data is available for every pivotal trial. Uh, and we looked at the different drugs approved for psoriasis and. Um, you know, subsequently have also looked at dupilumab, um, uh, and a biologic for atopic dermatitis. And when you look at the data, a couple of things emerge. The rate of viral infections appears to be higher with TNF blockers, although not much higher than the placebo group. Um, uh, but all of the TNF blockers carry black box warnings about infection. Uh, and certainly in practice over years using TNF blockers, we see that. Um, we, uh, when you look at the um, other drugs, uh, ustekinumab, there is no increase. Um, you know, ustekinumab is a special issue because it blocks IL-12 and 23. Um, and, uh, you know, theoretically, IL-12 has a significant role in protection against viral infections. But it turns out there's so much redundancy in the body, um, and IL-23 is part of that redundancy, that we don't see an increase in viral infections in patients on ustekinumab. Um, the other side of that is that the IL-23 blockers, which are newer, are more targeted, but also more effective. So we have a good opportunity to switch to the IL-23 blockers. Um, the IL-17 blockers, again, the rates of infection were very low and almost the same as placebo, uh, not very different. And same for the IL-23 blockers, just very low rates of infection and not very different than placebo. So uh, uh, a lot of uh, patient organizations and medical organizations have come out with recommendations that are similar to what we have done. Certainly, if anyone has active infection, they're discouraged from using any of these drugs. Um, there are some theories out there that if you keep patients on the drugs, you will prevent what is called the cytokine storm uh, and might actually prevent the deaths that we're seeing in uh, COVID-19 infection uh, that results in severe pneumonia, acute respiratory distress syndrome. Um, but that is speculation, that's not proven. Um, there's a, a special case for dupilumab, uh, which is not covered in my article because we only spoke about the psoriasis drugs, but dupilumab uh, is used to treat not only atopic dermatitis, but also asthma. And asthma is clearly a uh, respiratory symptom that complicates pneumonia and makes the, the likelihood of a worse outcome go up. Uh, and so, um, there's even questions as to whether we should stop dupilumab during COVID-19 infection. And I think no, none of us know the answer to that, and we will find out the answer. Um, we have an enormous number of patients on biologic therapies at Mount Sinai. Uh, I personally have had at least five patients who developed COVID-19 infection. Um, the, uh, and I can say that when all of this is over, we will have much more data. Uh, interestingly, we certainly have over a thousand patients on dupilumab. I'm not aware of a single patient who has 
been symptomatic from COVID-19 on, uh, on dupilumab. So I don't know if indeed it is protective. And, you know, what we're saying is uh, that by, you know, treating asthma, it's preventing some of the respiratory symptoms that you get with COVID-19 infection. But certainly we are not seeing uh, patients who are on the verge of death with dupilumab. And we are seeing a lot of patients on the verge of death. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, large numbers of patients in the ICU, many uh, intubated. Um, and that's something that at least so far um, has not been a, a big issue, by the way, with biologics either. We are not seeing many patients on biologic therapies who are intubated or dying. There are at least two reports of patients on different biologics who have um, for psoriasis who have died. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, considering the vast number of patients on biologics and the vast number of uh, COVID-19 patients, you'd expect that, they that among them would be patients on uh, biologic therapies. I noticed you had said you, you've had a few patients who've developed symptoms. How have you gone about, and, and they are on biologic, how have you gone about, um, I guess, helping them did you know were were you able to switch them off or was it something where it was it was better to wait and see Do so we have many we have many questions so certainly if anyone who's developed the infection we withhold biologic therapy um the the other question that arises you know hydroxychloroquine and uh, azithromycin are used to treat covid19 infection in many sites in mount Sinai certainly is using a lot of those um there's a controversy about uh, hydroxychloroquine being used in psoriasis patients, but we have actually advocated that the patients get the treatment. We'll deal with their psoriasis afterward. Let's save their life for now. And uh, I, I don't know if that's the reason our patients have done well, but uh, we've had at least one very sick patient uh, who uh, who turned around when we made when we put him on uh, azithromycin and uh, a CPAC. Um, the uh, it, the question comes up when I get a phone call from a patient. You know, I had my injection of let's say used to Kinumab two weeks ago. What do I do? Well, first of all, it's given every three months, so they got two and a half months to make a decision. Um, secondly, the duration of benefit does last longer. So unless the psoriasis is coming back, you're not pressed to give it to them right away. Um, had another patient who is a female. A 28-year-old childbearing potential is on um, uh, sertolizumab pegol, uh, and she and that's the one biologic we have that doesn't cross the placenta, and she's planning a pregnancy, so she feels good about being on that drug and doesn't want to switch to another one because the others do cross the placenta, and um, so we had the conversation, and honestly, because she's 28, she's at a very low risk uh, to begin with, uh, and um, you know, so we're keeping her on the sertolizumab pickle. We're asking her to isolate herself a little bit more, protect herself against getting the virus. But, um, you know, my level of concern is is not high for that. Is there anything else you think that would be helpful for your colleagues to know at this time? Uh, you know, I could go on and speak about this for hours. Um, you know, we're using lots of other drugs. Uh, dr uh, IL-6 blockers appear to maybe potentially benefit uh, our patients. Um, uh, you know, cyclosporin and methotrexate are quite immunosuppressive, and uh, I'm concerned about patients being on those. But when you look at the data about viral infections with methotrexate, it's not a lot. And interestingly, cyclosporin years ago was shown to actually have an anti coronavirus effect. So, you know, again, all everything we're saying now is intelligent speculation. When we have the data from now tens of thousands of patients we're seeing, and certainly at Mount Sinai, many of the, many of the patients we have are on biologics, I think we're going to have a much more accurate picture. Um, there are several registries being formed, uh, and, um, uh, and I think at the end of all of this, the registries will provide us with some data. Um, the the pre-existing registries like Corona, um, are actually a very good source of information because we know what proportion of patients were on each biologic, and we know we will find out how many of them developed the infection, and also how many of them developed severe infection requiring major interventions. Um, we've started a registry 
uh, at Mount Sinai that will also be quite accurate because we're, um, we're actually checking serologies, um, getting accurate histories, breaking the patients down into how bad their disease was. Uh, and um, so basically any, um, and we're not just looking at biologic patients who got COVID-19, we're gonna actually expand it to a larger population. Uh, including the non-biologics and also um, uh, patients who didn't get the infection, uh, just to give us a sense of what proportion of patients were affected with each drug. So that's the kind of registry that would re really be valuable. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. I really do appreciate it. All Happy right. to help.